Welcome and bienvenidos to our new program called Next Generation, highlighting the many creative journeys of next generation leaders. In this series, I will bring you the stories of young leaders in science, literature, medicine, education, and business. Those who have chosen to reach further, travel farther, innovate, and take the risks often necessary to make a difference in their own lives, in those of their families, their communities, and someday in the world. My name is Julieta Garcia. For over 22 years, I had the great privilege of serving as president of the University of Texas at Brownsville. Through that work, I came to know the stories of many of our students that overcame great obstacles to attend college and through great sacrifice of their own and of their families, make it through. Getting to know their stories was always a great inspiration to me. So I thought I'd chase some of them down, interview them, and let you hear in their own words what they're up to now, what their challenges were, and what they hope to accomplish in the future. I promise you will be as inspired, amazed, and humbled by their accomplishments as I have been. Now let's get started. Filmmaker, photographer, author, and National Geographic Emerging Explorer, Sandish Kadoor creates award-winning wildlife documentary films and photography books, exposing the need to conserve threatened species and habitats around the world. With subjects ranging from king cobras to clouded leopards, his films have appeared worldwide on the National Geographic Channel, the BBC, and the Discovery Channel. More recently, Sandish joined conservationist and National Geographic fellow Steve Boys and the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project team in Botswana to document a new 360-degree video series, The Okavango Experience. Sandish's many awards include the CWEM Environmental Photographer of the Year, Nature's Best Photography Award, the International Conservation Photographer Award, and two Green Oscar nominations at the Wild Screen Film Festival. But that describes Sandish Kadur today. Our interview focuses on Sandish as a young 17 year old sent from India to live with his uncle in Brownsville, Texas. Because it was here on the campus of then University of Texas at Brownsville, and now the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, that his journey to becoming an internationally known conservationist began. Good morning. It is my great pleasure today to welcome to our studios Sandish Kadur. Sandish started out at University of Texas at Brownsville, Texas Southmost College, in 1997. He came as a student from India. And that's all I will tell you about his story, because the rest of it he will tell us as we are here together. But we welcome this now wonderful uh, young man who has become a filmmaker, a conservation photographer, and many, many other things um, in his life. Uh, but still honors us by coming back to this campus, back to the city, and back to the people that um, that helped him dream of what he could become. So, Sandish, uh, welcome home. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to be here, Dr. Garcia. It's great to have you here. It's like you've never left, but I know you have, and, and I've been watching your films, and so I know of the strange and wonderful places that you've had an opportunity to visit. So let's, let's take our listeners back to the very beginning. You started out in India, and, um, and tell us a little bit about how you ended up in Brownsville, Texas. <laughs> That's always the million-dollar question, isn't it? Uh, people always ask me, how did you end up in Brownsville, Texas, from India. I mean, it's such a bizarre, you know, uh, coincidence that I actually ended up here. So I had a very dismal career in high school in India. <laughs> it was uh, one of those things where your grandfather is a botanist, your father is an entomologist, both professors at big universities in India. And here you have a high school dropout. So they said, all right, can't stay in India much longer. So they sent me on exile to come live <laughs> in Brownsville, Texas with my uncle, who's um, uh, Dr. Lakshmikant, who's a doctor of orthopedics, orthopedic surgeon in Brownsville. So he said, okay, you can live, live with him and get a diploma or something. 
and anything. then come back. Anything. <laughs> Some education. Make us proud. <laughs> and they, they had no idea what was to come. Yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, in many ways fortunate to come to Brownsville because then I joined the Gorgas Science Society. And uh, little did my parents realize that uh, right next door is Mexico and Rancho del Cielo and the field station, the mountains, the cloud forests, all the things I love is what I was taken away from, <laughs> and here it is right next door. So even in India, you started out with a great interest in photography, and how did that, uh, how did that bloom for you? So uh, India is a very wild landscape, although it's known for its billion people, there's also tremendous wildlife. Mm -hmm. So I spent time photographing wildlife uh, around where I lived, and that started with my father's ancient Nikormat camera, and I used to take that with me and just photograph things that I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. So I, it, I, photography to me was a documentation tool, nothing more than that, and that led to, you know, many things. And actually, I think that interest in going outdoors, photographing wildlife, getting addicted to the hobby of photography, all of that led to my problems at school. <laughs> or, or now that this is a great career. But, but so you left India with your father's um, camera still or not? Oh, no, no, he wouldn't let me no. have his camera. <laughs> so he, returned, he kept it. Returned <laughs> the camera. With, I came with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and came to Brownsville, joined uh, uh, the folks here at the university, and then discovered Rancho del Cielo. And for our listeners that don't know what Rancho del Cielo was to students here, give us a little idea of what that was, um, what that first exposed you to. So Rancho del Cielo was the uh, university's field station. It was the biology station about six hours south of here. And uh, the Gorgas Science Society, which was a science club on campus, they took field trips uh, down to that cloud forest, which is a magical place. Mm -hmm. It's a unique habitat. It's the northernmost cloud forest in the Americas. You have species from South America, podocarpus trees, growing next to sugar maple trees that are more common in Vermont. So it's a transition zone between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Similarly, you have bird species and animal species all reaching their northern and southernmost limits at that little three-mile-long ledge. And to a naturalist like myself, it was just mind-boggling, the amount of new species I was seeing and discovering all the time. So every opportunity I got, I was down in the cloud forest, you know, working with the Gorgas Science Society, working with my mentor, Lawrence Loff, and spending as much time as I could down there. Now, to get to Rancho del Cielo was not an easy task. As I recall, we would leave the campus early in the morning, stop for breakfast along the way at some little restaurant or cafe, really, and then uh, get to... Ciudad Victoria, then Gomez Farias. And there we would get, we would leave the comfort of the air-conditioned suburbans. And and how would we make the trek up the mountain, do you recall? Oh, yeah, that was actually <laughs> the most, uh, the fun part of the journey. Right. So from Gomez Farias was the transfer into these rugged 4x4 four four Dodge Ram pickup trucks. And all the equipment and the students, everyone would get loaded in the back of this truck. <laughs> and the first couple of uh, first two two kilometers were okay. And then after that, started this rapid ascent up this bouncy, rocky ravine, basically mm -hmm. that only a four by four pickup could achieve. Going up the eastern side of the Sierra Madre to get up to the ledge. And I think that was uh, probably for some the, 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 the most fun part of the journey of getting there, mm -hmm. just the adventure of reaching the field station. And acting like pioneers. You know, when you got up to the top of that, that uh, to the camp, you, you thought you were the first person to ever make it there. And then you discovered you were not because what was there was a beautiful encampment of, of, uh, of wonderful cabins that had been built by students. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the beautiful cabins, and yes, um, it's been there for you know many years. It was the fifties that mm -hmm, it was built mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. So just the kind of legacy that the university or the, the Southmost College 
and the field station program shared over so many decades, uh, you can see the work of all the students because everything there was built by students mm -hmm. over the last several decades. Mm -hmm. And that was such a great base camp for students going in now mm -hmm. to ignite their curiosity about the natural world, to really get them passionate, not just about nature and, and wildlife or, mm -hmm. or birds, it's also about the collaboration. Because you go there as students, you come together as a team, uh, mm -hmm. you, you are with each other, you learn about carpentry, you learn how to fix the vehicle, you, mm -hmm. you know, mechanics, you learn plumbing, you learn all of these things, basic life skills. And I think that's my biggest takeaway, mm -hmm. going there uh, with the Gorga Science Foundation, working with Lawrence Law, working with uh, Guillermo, and just that, that whole building of collaboration, mm -hmm. and also learning the ropes of every single life skill that mm -hmm. you can think about. Learning to speak with people, learning to be engaging, mm -hmm. and more than anything, telling stories. <laughs> and we had lots of stories to tell. Uh, one of the things that I think, uh, in in addition to all the things that you beautifully stated, is the fact that we were doing this in a, in a different country, in a foreign country, and the respect that was required as a result of that. I think oh. meeting the people that also needed parts for their trucks, offering them the parts that we had in our own truck, and then receiving help when we needed it from those that have make the mountain their home. Absolutely. And, and that really you know, gives you that deep-rooted respect of you know uh, other cultures, other places, foreign places, and learning to work under difficult conditions. So you went up as what we used to call the ranch kids. You became one of Lawrence Loft's <laughs> famous ranch kids. And, and those were students who, who had a, a little bit of a flame going for photography or language or study or just being a member of a group. And, uh, but by the time you left, you had developed something much deeper. Uh, what kind of what, what did that ignite finally in your, that, that helped you become who now you've become? So I think uh, there were lots of stories exchanged over dinner, and one of the conversations led to the mountain range where I came from in India, right. the yeah. Western Ghats, mm -hmm. the Sahyadris. And and then that's when uh, Larry Loft said, well, why don't we make a documentary about that uh, incredible, sound, exotic landscape? And the, cons the mission for the Gorga Science Foundation was always conservation through education. And to that end, they produced beautiful documentaries. They had already produced one about the Rio Grande Valley, about uh, Rancho del Cielo, about that landscape. And now this exotic landscape I spoke about uh, ignited their curiosity. And it's always nice to dream and dream big. And John Bax was the, uh, the filmmaker who had made several films with Larry Loff and uh, the foundation. And I was going to be his apprentice. Uh, and they said, well, if you're interested, let's get this thing going. And John was interested. And we were off on a journey to India. And we got our plane tickets and everything. And one week before the trip, John Bax calls me up and he says, Sandesh, uh, I don't think I can go to India. I said, what do you mean, John? By now, I was so excited that I would be John's apprentice that I had told everybody that I'm going to <laughs> India. And of course you Being were. John's <laughs> apprentice, we're going to go make a documentary about yes, the Western Ghats. Yeah. Uh, I was just you so, had a new camera? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, no, you no, didn't no, have the no, camera yet? It was yet. going to be oh. John's 16 millimeter, oh. <laughs> super 16 ancient camera, but it was going to be great to learn all of that. And one week before, he just says, he can't go. He says... I'm too old to go to India. I said, no, John, you're not too old. I'll take care of you. And he's, you know, Belgian, strong man. And, uh, but it was hard to reconvince him about that. And then Larry Loft called me to the office and he said, well, I said, well, back to the books, I suppose. He's like, do you still want to make the film? I was 20 years old. I had nothing to lose. Um, I said, I had no idea how to make a documentary. I said, yes. My and he goodness. said, okay, figure out what you need in 
in perfect Larry Loft style. Of course. Figure out what you need. And I figured out what I need. I needed a camera and a tripod. The two basic things <laughs> necessary <laughs> to make the film. He said, okay. And he put it on his personal credit card, $10,000. And and got the camera. It arrived the day I was leaving on the oh, flight to India. Oh my goodness! Yeah. So the story there is that you you actually learned the camera on the long flight back to India. Is that That's right? That's right. That was uh, <laughs> my instruction manual was how to turn it on, how to use it. Yeah. That's a fascinating story. It's a wonderful story about Lawrence Loff and about the kind of dedication he's always had uh, for our students and for the work here at the university. Um, and it's a wonderful story about having faith in a in a young student, and not wanting to 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 do anything except help them take that next step forward. Okay, so you go to India and you just start making your documentary. You make your way in the area that you had planned with uh, John Bax. Yeah, it was only supposed to be a three month college summer project. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so um, we didn't really think much more beyond that. And um, the 20 Gorgas Science Society students were going to come to That's India. Right. So we had, we had really made the expedition for them really big. So I was going to go ahead, prepare the trip for them while I continue to film. And when they came, take them across the country. So they came to India, took them from the Taj Mahal all the way down to the south to see leopards and elephants. And, and leeches, as I recall. Oh, leeches, yes. <laughs> the most memorable part yes. of the trip, the leech hike. Yes. Yeah. yeah very good memory. <laughs> and, um, and then at the end of that, I realized that after three months, I had nothing to show in terms of good footage. I, I had a background as a still photographer, mm -hmm. but not as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. They're similar d disciplines, but at, at the same time, very mm -hmm. different. And I kind of learned that uh, uh, on the way. And then much to my parents' dismay, I decided to drop out of college mm -hmm. and stay in India until I got this right. I couldn't let mm -hmm. Mr. Loff down. I had to make something that he would be proud of, I would be proud of. So I stayed back in India, continuing to film and film and film until, you know, almost two and a half, three years later, I had a lot of footage that now we could construct and tell a story. Somehow I remember those years, and I remember them very vaguely, but I remember asking, and where is Sandish? And Larry would kind of lower his head a little bit. He said, he's still filming. And that was his answer the whole, every time I would ask him, and have you heard from Sandish? Yes, I've heard from Sandish. He's still filming. <laughs> <laughs> but he never yeah. wavered in his belief that something good was going to come of this, regardless of what anyone else might have wondered about. Not, not uh, Larry. He knew he had launched uh, a good spirit on a, on a new adventure. Okay, so, so Sandish, you finish your first documentary, and what do you do with it? How do you produce it? Or So I came back with all of this, you know, hundreds of hours of footage, and that's where really that collaboration between uh, the Gorgas Science Foundation and the University of Texas, Texas Southmost College, really came together because the folks at Media, Ricardo, Norberto, all these guys were, you know, so experienced, and they kind of trained me in the whole aspect of editing, you know, how do you make the story come together? And um, so all of that really helped. Uh, and also equipment, the kind of support we got from the university. Mm -hmm. It was a true collaboration. And the most beautiful part about it was Dr. Garcia came on board <laughs> to lend her beautiful voice to narrating the film. And that's when we actually see, saw the whole film come together and take shape. So it was, uh, and that's when I realized the beauty and power of collaboration. And we made the film. It was 50 minutes long, and we aired it. We screened it right here mm -hmm. in South Texas at the Alonzo Building at the university. And uh, then the film went on to win a whole bunch of awards all around the world. Uh, I just stop right there. That's incredible, right? Who would have ever thought that an effort that started out so innocently and in a in a in a kind of a lost in space environment for a while would end up winning awards worldwide, which is what you did with that first film? 
Yes, and, and that was good because <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> because it wasn't that only we saw it as successful. Yes, it's when the world saw it as successful. Yes, that's when we can say, okay, okay, I guess that was a good effort. <laughs> I don't know if we want to repeat this four-year effort again, but uh, at the same time. Uh, Discovery Channel got it, uh, saw it, and picked it up and broadcast it. It's even being broadcast even now, you know, 10 years later or 12 years later. Isn't that amazing? Well, I guess, you know, that, that story, if we stopped your story right there, that would have been your degrees from the university, right? Because a, because a, a degree is is not about the paper. It is about the experience that you have while you're at the university. And although we make a big deal of the paper and the, the sheepskin that we handed out on, really it's what you learn uh, in terms of collaboration, as you said, and the study and the love of this, of discovery. And that's what you did in your work epitomizes. Okay, so... That one's done. It's still being shown. But but you now have had an extraordinary journey beyond what any one of us could have imagined. So tell us if you can. Give us a little bit of a taste of where that first film and that trajectory then had you land today. So the university was very kind. They actually gave me that piece of paper that said I graduated. <laughs> we had to respond to your father and, you know, we weren't going to, we needed yeah, that too. Yeah. So, so once that was done and out of the way, I, uh, I stuck around for a while. We made a series of six short films for about the Rio Grande Valley, short films for the foundation. And then I really realized the importance of education and really spreading the word of education with moving images, uh, video. And it's, it's a very powerful tool. And when this documentary was shown in India at the Western Ghats Symposium, Dr. Kamal Bawa, the head of uh, an organization named ATRI, uh, one of India's biggest conservation NGOs, saw the film and he said, oh my God, we need to make this into a book. And I, we had a meeting with him the next day. And then six months later, we came up with a book about the Western Ghats, a coffee table book. And both the book and the documentary were sent to UNESCO. And the UNESCO uh, used all of these as the submission dossier and declared the Western Ghats as a world heritage site. And that's when I realized the power that videos and photographs can have in shaping policy. And it really uh, kind of like uh, made that mission statement of the Gorgas Science Foundation, conservation through education, very strong in my mind. You know, Sandish, when I recall that, that you had had that kind of impact to finally get the Western Ghats into a, to become a, a world heritage site, that could have been worth a person's entire career. That yeah, could have, it true. could have ended right there because that's what many of us strive to do, to have impact beyond ourselves and into the future. And you did that in an extraordinary way. And you did that with your first documentary. That's ex- <laughs> you realize how extraordinary that was, but yeah. it wasn't meant to be uh, the last um, wonderful adventure that you had. So tell us, uh, if you can, g- give us an idea of what that, what that next adventure became and where you are now and what you're doing. So that uh, opened up many doors, the success of the documentary, and then that kind of got me in onto that. Uh, it, it's like one thing leads to another, and that's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. The book was launched in Missoula, Montana. Someone from the BBC saw the book and my presentation about the behind the scenes of making the book, and they said, this is a perfect BBC natural world and then the BBC approached me to make a documentary and they called it exactly the same as what I had named my first film Mountains of the Monsoon so the BBC made the BBC version of Mountains of the Monsoon Mm. and that was um, uh, around I guess it was around 90 2006 yeah around that time Uh, and then after that worked with uh, National Geographic on a documentary on king cobras um, and spent about a year filming the world's largest venomous snake and made a film for them and that kind of opened up a different door with National Geographic uh, which now I'm an explorer and a fellow 
uh, with them and they're extremely supportive. They're like a wonderful big family. And the best part about the association with National Geographic is that any story that I have, they help amplify it to the kind of reach that they have. And that's how we can really put those stories and the message across and, and with National Geographic's help, get it across to the rest of the world. Now, have you had any more um, work dealing with conservation and preservation, like determining that some site was so important, it also had to become a World Heritage Site? So, uh, not as big. As uh, that first one. In, in, yeah. As big as the first one. Mm-hmm. But we've had uh, many small successes mm-hmm. along the way. Uh, after the Western Ghats book, we worked again on a book about the Himalaya, the big mountain range. Mm-hmm. And uh, that book has had similar impact in terms of like, it's a body of work that tells decision makers and policy makers mm-hmm. that this is an important landscape. And these are the reasons why. It's a combination of art and science mm-hmm. put together. Mm-hmm. And that combination uh, accessible to policy makers will really help have a long-term impact. And that's what that book is about. You've also done something with uh, baby, uh, was it leopards or tigers? <laughs> or what was yeah. that? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, oh, that was a beautiful project. It was. Yeah, the Return of the Clouded Leopards. Yes, yes. So uh, these two orphan cu- uh, clouded leopard cubs uh, were found in, in, a, in the middle of a jungle. Uh, woodcutters had cut down the tree. And the veterinary doctors who saw it said, oh, my God, what are these? And then I, I immediately I saw that these are clouded leopards went to that landscape and worked with the wildlife vets in that area for the next two years until the cubs were fully grown and then they were released back into the wild. So I saw that and I saw that film and I, I, you became a mother and a father to those cubs <laughs> as the, did the others who were working with them and eventually, as you say, did reintroduce them. Yes. And had a, must have had a, a very difficult time letting go much as a parent worries about their child as they go off to school or go back into life. And I, true, true. Yeah. And uh, but it's very heartwarming. It's very rewarding. Yeah. And it's really the first time that those cats had ever been filmed, uh, even though they weren't wild cats. But we did release them back in the wild. Yes. And my most recent project with National Geographic called Wild Cats of India kind of like goes back, touches on that story, and then puts me on a mission to actually find wild clouded leopards and that's my most recent mission which i've accomplished and you'll be able to see it (laughs) in big cat week next year uh january 2020 that is wonderful well okay so sandish you're now talking to students that are currently at utrgb and let's say imagine that i have a hundred students here in front of you and they're captivated by your story and your stories about the adventures that you've had. And they're thinking, yes, but I'm not special like Sandish. I don't think I could do what he's done. What do you tell our students about what, what it takes to do, the kind, to, to do the kind of work that you're doing and to have the kind of success that you've had? I think the very first step is to be passionate, to find what you're passionate about, to develop that kind of passion And then you need to have the perseverance to be able to go after what you're passionate about and then stick to it and have the patience to come to that final resolve. But unless you have the passion, you're not going to get, you know, where you need to be. So find your passion, persevere, and have the patience to achieve it. And it's beautifully said. And and I think that also opens the door for us to think about the many people that that you needed along the way and how it is one, it is essential for us to find in our lives one or two or ten people and at different times they play different roles who also have faith in not what we are but in what we can become beyond what e- we're even thinking for ourselves and so that's certainly what happened to you by knowing Lawrence Loft um, as you mentioned, Guillermo and Norberto and um, Ricardo and, and the many people who today still, every time Sandish comes back into town, will gather 
to make sure they get to touch <laughs> your adventure and be part of it in a small way. Yeah, and it's lovely to come back and share stories with everybody. Yeah. That's what you know. That's what it's about. That's right. It's about sharing stories. That's right. Ignite and inspire people. Well, it is. It is so wonderful to have you back on our campus. Thank you for honoring us with your presence and with your wonderful stories there. And I know we could sit here and, and tell many. I I saw one of you when you were looking for the tiger. And you under a kind of camouflage tent, and you have day one and day two and day three. And, and I was thinking to myself as I had my nice little cup of coffee this morning, how did he have coffee? What did he do for those many days? So someday we'll, we'll interview you again so that I can get a better view of how tough it is and how lonely it is and can be to do this work But when you're not in front of the cameras. So, <laughs> but we thank you. We thank you very much for... Uh, allowing us to travel this journey with you. Well, thank you very much for having me here, Dr. Garcia. Well, we'll it's been a pleasure. Thank you. We'll, we'll see you back again. Okay, look forward to All it. All right. Thank you, Sandish. Thank you for tuning in to Next Generation, a program highlighting the next generation of leaders in the Rio Grande Valley and beyond.